what the gist of it? No, uh -uh. we were just okay. talking about art. Okay. And um, you can't make money off of what we were talking about. So okay. <laughs> that's why all the books are so cheap, incidentally. Um, and there's only, I think, two books that you have to buy, two books. So did you see, oh, anyway, I'll show you in the syllabus in a minute. Um, Ivy, did you want to talk about what is art? What do you think? Because you're an art major, right? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, to my, uh, and then, okay, so to me, art is basically like a release. It's a way to explain things that words cannot. I know, especially nowadays, a lot of people have trouble um, using words and figuring out what they mean because there's a lot of words that have different meanings than what is written in the whatever so with art you're able to ex depict exactly what you mean and to someone else you know it might give them a different message or they might find clarity or they might find like wow other people relate or you know some kind of peace because of your art it it's a lot uh, but basically it's a release for me. Okay, so you said a release, but you also said a way of communicating, right? Yes, a way of communicating and it's a way of showing the time, the environment, the culture of then and now and comparing it to the past. You know, it, it's a lot. You're, Art show, is also you're showing it's people things rather than telling them things. Yeah, like, uh, like uh, construction, that's art, it's a type of art. And you're, instead of saying, oh, this is, you have to cut it up like this and like that, you can actually show them. I don't know, I still haven't gotten better with my words. <laughs> oh, no, it, it makes sense, right? <laughs> it is <clears throat> telling people stuff, uh, preaching to them, you know, ordering them around. Um, is just doesn't doesn't express what that's not what human beings are, right? I don't think it's like a set in stone answer, if that makes sense. Sure, it has different connotations. That's right. Um, Liam, are you there? Can you guys yes, turn on your um, videos? Was, Good. Um, I. Can't. I can't Good. turn on my video. I am dialed in, like I'm calling in because the I could not hear or understand you guys when I wasn't. This time, I don't think I can, okay. but I will. Are you on back. campus? Um, I am, wait, what was the question? Are you on campus? Yes, I am on campus. Okay, are you at the library? I am indeed at the library. Did you want to come to the Miller room? Yeah, why don't you go to the Miller room? Yeah, why don't you go to the Miller room and then you both can look at me together. Is that okay, Leo? Yeah. Sorry, I was just in here working on forms and stuff already. So I kind of forgot that I could walk over there. It's okay. Okay. Well, I think it's worth waiting for because having both of you there, being able to talk to each other and whatever, and I'll talk to Ivy about stuff that I, I mean, we have a little catching up to do anyway. So is that okay, Liam? Yes, I am on my over now. Okay. Okay. So Ivy, um, Let's see, I don't, we didn't really go through the syllabus specifically so much last time. Um, and you've had a Dr. Beck class before. So um, is this the, I went to the classroom with the link that you gave me. It says fall 2020. Um, let's see, on which, on the Schoology or on, on the classroom because I tried yeah to okay no that's that's it it's fall 2020 um 
I don't yeah. I don't know how to change the name at the top. You can maybe explain. Do I that. have to scroll all the way down? Yeah, you do have to scroll all the way down. Now that's you know it's bad, except that you know that everything you want is on it, right? That's the good part, is that all the materials are right there at your fingertip. And you're not going to have to wait for Dr. Beck to post it. You're not going to have to, I don't know. I, I just think overall, just having that right there is helpful. It was a little confusing with the days because I did go to that classroom and try to find the uh, reading for tonight. OK, so. I mean, that was for the night before. Um, let's see. If you scroll, did you scroll all the way down? It says this is the syllabus chart for the semester. Yes. What oh, is screen sharing, right? So I'm sharing my screen. Okay, I see. Okay, so did you try to scroll all the way down yesterday, or I scrolled all the way down, but I didn't see the. Uh, reading okay so that was the first day and then here's the reading here does that make sense it didn't, yeah it didn't pop up like that online it just says two attachments but i didn't see the two attachments at first well huh. like it doesn't say like that if that makes sense you think that's going to be happening again because it should be all there yeah, like i have to click on it in order to see it right Okay, so here is the reading, right? And you can, you know, that's what I do because my have old eyes. So did you manage to read, read the whole thing? No. Did you read part of it? I had to walk here. You had to what, work? Walk here. Oh. When you sent it to me. I was getting ready to come here. Okay. Um, all right. Well, okay. So um, I'll have it done by tonight. Okay, good. Um, the other thing, uh, Ivy, is you want to meet you and I on Legacy right after this class? Yeah. Was there a reading or something for that? No, nope. no. Nope. Okay. okay. Um, and the third thing is, to have these classes, these two classes, on Monday, Wednesday, from 8 to 9.15, that Liam would do the philosophy of art at 8, and then the legacy one at 9.30 or 9.15, just for an hour, Ivy, because we don't have to have the whole time. Would that work for you, Monday, Wednesday, at 8 and 9.15? Yeah. Okay, good. So that's how we'll do it. And then I have another class Tuesday, Thursday at eight. So, um, all right, uh, let's start. With, let's go over the syllabus because we didn't really go over it super closely last time. Um, but I think both of you have had Dr. Beck classes, so you both know. Um, okay, so I can change the time on this. It's going to be eight o'clock. Do you guys have WhatsApp? I can certainly get it. Okay, because you can call me in Indonesia on WhatsApp for free. And I think that I know the country code is one, and I know you put a plus, but sometimes plus oh one or plus oh oh one or some damn thing. But I think it's just plus one because I've been at this for a lot of years and it was a lot more complicated before. But anyway, um, the other thing is you can email me if you want to meet for office hours and I you can tell me in the next 24 hours what hours you're free and then we will arrange because I'm, I'm sure I'll be able to meet with you at some point in those 24 hours. Does that make sense? Yes. And then the next thing is next week, we will meet in person in the Miller room because I'll be in town. 
Okay, it will be nice to see you. Um, now the principles of art book, I have it scanned and it's not very pleasant to read it, but it's possible. So the only book you really need that I can't get, I haven't scanned and I can't get online are the Kumara Suwami, which doesn't cost very much and the beauty Cambridge lecture series and that costs eight, eighteen dollars and I think, yeah if you get them used you can get them even cheaper like I, for all of them shipping was more expensive than the actual books <laughs> yeah that happens that happens when I send stuff to my grandkids <laughs> um is that all right with you Ivy yes Okay, I think the legacy class is free. Everything is online because it's all old stuff. Um, okay. <laughs> all right, so these are the questions that every time we read something, uh, I have co copied and pasted from that reading that author's answer to these questions because each author and it has a different flow of reasoning, a different kind of argument, a different way of looking at things. But usually, eventually, they bring in these issues. And what's interesting to me is what they don't say. A lot of times, you know, it's what really what people what drives them to disagree is ignorance, to ignore. Like they didn't consider this other stuff. It, does that make sense, Ivy? I mean, that's why you want you would want to create art in the first place, is that people are ignorant. They don't know, right? They don't know what it feels like. They don't know what your life is like in you know if you're poor or if you're minority or if you're whatever that's why i think the greatest art that's going to come in your generation is going to be all these groups um african americans latinos in where i live laotian cambodian ethiopian somalian they're all going to have it be able to find their voice and express their voice and I think that's going to be a more authentic voice than a lot of what we call art, which is white, privileged Western Westerners, you know. But that's just to encourage you that this this class is not about being a snob. Does that make sense? Or um, I wish there were more artists among the working class, right? People who've been uh, marginalized by capitalism, they've been left behind. And they do go out there and demonstrate. And they, the public identity, you know, is that they're, you can label them anything you want. But underneath that is pain and suffering and disappointed expectations. I just wish there were more art actually about that. And um, there was a guy named J.D. Vance who wrote a book called Hillbilly Elegy. And he wrote about where he came from. But now he's running for politics and he is exploiting all of that. Like he's not, he's doing exactly the opposite of what that book should be about. Have any of you heard of J.D. Vance? Yes, I've also heard of Hillbilly Elegy, Elegy, I forgot which one, but I have very little experience with it. I just know it by name and reputation. I mean, it was really wide, wide read, but I mean, I think that's awful that because he understands them, he can punch their buttons and win elections instead of trying to communicate to the rest of us that we need to have empathy, that we need to understand, because we're never going to get over our polarization. Um, well, one other question for you, Ivy, for both of you, really. I mean, 
I assume that you agree that our country is polarized. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's a problem. Like history will say this is a serious problem. And I've read a number of books that say that's the beginning of authoritarianism. If the citizens cannot govern themselves and they create these splits and instability, then people start looking for a strong um, now, next question is, is art a way to overcome polarization? First of all, is it one way? Second of all, is it the only way? <laughs> or third of all, is it a major contributor and why? What do you think? I am going to bring up a specific band because I am of the mind that music is art. I don't know why that's so significant. So Rage Against the Machine is, a, 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 I think they're metal, a metal band that, you know, people on the far left and the far right both enjoy because it's music and music has mass appeal, but they both think that Rage Against the Machine is arguing for their point of view. <laughs> okay. There are a lot of people on the right that then, once like they read tweets of people in Rage Against the Machine, they're like, wow, they're just some sellouts. They don't, they, they kind of lost their way. I can't believe that they're this dumb. I thought they were with us and they were our people. And then Rage Against the Machine was like, we never have been. Like, I don't understand how you thought that. Like, have you listened to our lyrics? And it, they were, they were a middle ground. They were, an, they were artistic producers that gave art that was liked by both sides, but because the message was interpreted in a different way than was intended, they did appeal to both sides. And after that was, they discovered that it wasn't for both sides. They were no longer a figure that bridged the gap and it just became worse. And I think that that is a good example to bring up when saying that art can bring people together but the medium of art and the message of the art can I can do just as much to polarize further or to um, alienate individuals or even whole groups. Okay, so very good. Like that's the difference between being engaged with art and being an art critic, right? And so the people who were engaged, then when they were you know, linking it to their political agenda, they were being a critic. They were acting as a critic. Does that make sense? And yes. they, were, they were really bad critics, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, that's a, that's a great example, Liam. I hope you bother to put it in your post. I mean, I put a really small number of words, but I would love to um, have students tell me all this stuff that I don't know. And if it's not hard to just type it up, that, I'd appreciate that. Um, the other thing I, I did want to ask you is that someday I would like to write books about my classes and what the students say. And so at the end of each post, could you say, um, I give you my permission to publish this or I don't right? So that every post, I can know for sure if I've been given permission. Um, and at the end of the class, I'll probably make you sign a whole sheet that says I've, and we would clarify, make sure if there's one that you don't want or one part of it. And I'll clarify that maybe I'll cut it out. And so that uh, you will sign that so I don't have to go through each post. Uh, but anyway, you can think about that. And then you, I want you to write posts that are honest. And if some of those you do not want, you know, to get out, it would be all anonymous, but I definitely want you to trust the system. And I also want you to write posts that are honest. And if, and you just put at the bottom, no, I don't want this anywhere in the public. Okay. Uh, because that, like, for example, Liam, that's really interesting to me. And I, I just have to believe there's somebody somewhere who will publish what it's like to teach certain material in a certain way. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, the interpretation of art itself is an entire, like, I wouldn't say field of study, but I would definitely say that a portion of art history is just understanding how the interpretation of art has changed over time and how it can be perceived from the different perspectives. Or at least that's what I think art history should have at least a unit on. Well, the other thing is that what is education, right? Yeah. What is teaching? And my classes are different, right? I want you to tell me what's on your mind. I want you to come to know your own mind. I don't know if anybody teaches like this, but I know that I learn a lot and I think the students learn about themselves. Um, anyway, that's 20 years. I got 20 years to figure out what to do with myself for 25, so it'll, it'll be a while. All right, so on all of these readings, what is art? And then I'll go through this list and you can comment on any one or two things that strike you that I hadn't thought about that or yeah, that's important. What's the difference between art and non-art, art and junk, art and entertainment? What's the purpose of art? What does it do? What is beauty? What's the creative process? What do artists do? What's the relation between the artist and the work of art? What's the relation between the artist, the work of art, and the audience? What's the purpose of art criticism? What's the relation between art and nature, art and culture, art and science, art and politics, art and justice, art and religion, art and philosophy, art and education? art and manipulation, art and ethics, art and reason, uh, art and emotion, uh, art and psychology, art and truth, and what's the difference between an aesthetic experience and other experiences? Okay, reactions to the list. Um, I Letter E sticks out to me because beauty is such a strange thing to define. And in uh, 20th century, uh, I, think, I think it was specifically French feminism, um, it, beauty was an important factor because just understanding what the different philosophers, what their take on beauty was, was interesting. And we did discuss other ideas of beauty, like beauty being the sublime and then that being paired with what we talked about in the lit where beauty was such a big thing, especially for depictions of Satan in Paradise Lost and in the grotesque and kind of like fearful manner of the in the Metamorphosis by Kafka and just how beauty pertains to perspective and experience, as well as like conveying a message. So beauty is, is interesting because it's it's not difficult to say that everything can be viewed as beautiful, but it's also it is very difficult to say why something is beautiful, and people agree without question. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. okay, Ivy, what about you as an artist? Which of those questions, you know, mean a lot to you? Art and nature, I'd have to say, or shoot, art and emotion. Okay. So hard um. For emotion, it's because, okay, so like for the color blue, a lot of people think that is depressing and it's just melancholy, but like a lot of my art ha is blue and I didn't really think of it that way until I got here and I realized, oh, Picasso had his whole blue period and it's depressing. To me, it was like calm. It's, what's the word, serenity? Is that? Yeah, serenity. It's That's... like, you know, peaceful. So to know the different interpretations of color and how it correlates to emotion based throughout time, because I think it also like red, people tend to get that with anger and everything rather than passion, if that makes sense. So I feel like that would be a lot to unpack. I think that the relationship between color and, and color context and the art that it's used in 
is really important. I think that's really easy to tie to the relationship with nature and emotion because the color blue can represent the like terrifying unknown of you know the deep blue sea and the fear that comes with not knowing what's down there. It can come with the serene calm of clear skies. It can come with the um, uh, it can come with the emotional like tie that it has to sadness. And there's a lot of blue things out there. It's not a very natural color, but it is one of the most natural yeah natural colors um, that. I mean, you can tie to so many different emotions. And I do think that these questions all have direct ties to other questions, mm -hmm. which is going to make it really fun to try and write them all down. It's like the, um, you were mentioning the blue sea, that could be misinterpreted, or not misinterpreted, but that could be interpreted a lot of different ways. Like people draw portraits of, um, what is it, the ocean under a sunset and everything, mm -hmm. and no one really thinks, oh, that's terrifying, it's scary. scary. I but, what's beneath the surface. Yeah, but if you just like draw, I mean, paint a dark and eerie picture of the uh, ocean, then it definitely changes the yeah. message. It becomes the context of your colors and the message you're conveying rather than the color itself. Okay. If you think of it, more of the earth is blue than anything else, right? It's the sea, two thirds, and then the sky. So. Just the whole sky. Uh, what's interesting to me is blue is my favorite color. Royal blue is my favorite color. Um, and I. That's my name's Royal Blue. Azure is blue. Oh, yeah, that's right. It is. <laughs> I had forgotten what color. Anyway, um, yeah, one time I, I am also half Scandinavian. And I'm, I have a melancholy personality. And so I went to this artist, the Scandinavian artist show and everything was blue and white. So you have this whole room <laughs> and I'm just like, it made you feel a certain way. And I just thought, that's my guy, right? I get that. But actually just like you, um, Ivy, I don't think of it so much as depression. I think of it as digging deeper and getting to a deeper place because all this other stuff is just white noise to me. And so blue is the place I go. And um, it can be depressing if you think all the super, the ways people make their lives superficial, but that's not your main thing. Your main thing is you just wanna find this calm underneath all this drama and stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then of course I go to Greece and I'm totally in love. And anyway, long story, but that's that's great. If now we have one, we have one artist and we have one uh, philosopher who loves to reflect on art. And so I just think two are enough for this class because we're gonna spend all the time, I'm sure. I don't think anyone's gonna, we're gonna run out of, things to say. I hope not. Anyway, so expose you to some of the classical text. But the reason I do that is because you need to know how the culture has been affected by this. I honestly believe that the Enlightenment thinkers got it all wrong. So I'm not teaching you this to say this is what you should think. These are the great thinkers. But they had an incredible impact. So the society you're born into is the result of these powerful psychic movements, you know, the intellectuals and cultural leaders that came before you. <coughs> and a lot of, I think, deconstruction is like exposing that. But the problem is, well, what do you want instead? Right? Deconstruction is sort of violent and it's reactionary, whereas art is creative and it's um, creativity, right? Anyway, so then you, you reflect on this and I think both of you are convinced that art is important. Then we have the same usual stuff, uh, reading. I think the way I've chosen the readings is that they are all interconnected. It's like a dialogue between these writers and then the students have a dialogue between themselves uh, about the writers. And so I think each time you read something, you'll be able to connect it to something else. 
And you know that's deeper kind of reading. Um, then the papers as usual, the thesis statement and the normal stuff like that. For this class, you just have one research paper and that's on some favorite artist or art movement. And you have to have three sources, um, outside sources, and you can also use the class texts. Um, and then there's a final paper and your final paper is what is art, right? Just like all my classes. So every single class day, you have a final takeaway and do I think I'm gonna use this on my final paper or not and why? So uh, communicate orally, especially after you do your research paper, you have to give a formal presentation. Um, the content of the paper will get more complex. Um, the religion and philosophy. So there's some link between some kind of reasoning and some kind of idea of the good. Um, let's see, and then um, the intellectual honesty, the liberally minded person, intellectually honest, committed to truth. So artists are committed to truth in some way, fair to opposing points of view. So, I mean, people really disagree about art, right? And they really get, you know, <laughs> They get emotional about art. And so, you know, we have to figure out what to do with that. Patient with complexity and ambiguity. So these aren't quite as relevant when we're talking about art, but they're they're there, they're important. Uh, attendance is excused and unexcused. So hope I'm my, the plan is that I record everything. If you miss a day, um, do all the same things you'd do if there were, uh, if you'd come. So you read the material, write three comments before you listen to the video, listen to the video, write two or three more comments, and then do your takeaway. So it should be, you know, it shouldn't be too hard. Now, um, if I know I'm going to miss a class, um, I will lecture. Um, you know, what I'd like you to do, <laughs> I could give like a 20 minute lecture, 30, 20 to 30, but you two could go to the Miller room at one o'clock um, and just talk to each other about the material. Or what you could do is you don't need to listen to my video until you come and then you come and maybe talk to each other first. You know, what did you get out of it? and then turn on the video and then you have a class does that sound okay yeah okay i mean that eases my mind a lot because you know i'm not quite sure what i'm going to run into when i get there but okay good i'm glad because i i just did think you each of you could have a nice conversation with each other um all right so we'll plan for that um here's all the attendance stuff as usual um, and then you have 13 posts. Each one counts five points. Um, it doesn't have to be 300 words. So I, I'm sorry about this. I should be 200, but I really think both of you are going to write more than that. Just um, because, just try to free associate so you're not worried about writing bullshit to meet the word count. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, just try to, if, if you had your main thing you wanted to say, and then you could say, well, how does this relate to what we've said before? Just to put in a few more words, but um, all right. So that's five points each. I've got the grade book both on Google Classroom and on Schoology because it was a requirement that we have to put our grade books on Schoology and our syllabi on Schoology. So I did all that. And I'll record that. Um, with Schoology, I can't, I couldn't figure it out. So it only went up to 10 points. And so for the paper, I have two, two things. I have a 10 point and then I have five extra points. And so when I grade your paper, I'll put the same grade in both of those slots. And so I think it'll come out percentage-wise the same. And then with the final paper is 20 points. So I'll put 10 points, 10 points, and I have two slots. So I think it'll come out percentage wise the way it's supposed to, but it's one of those things that's annoying and I don't want to really try to spend 
a huge amount of time figuring it out, if that's okay with you, if it's not too confusing. Um, all right, so then I do, you know, I have a policy for lateness, but I don't like enforcing it. I know both of you, and I know that you will come if you can, right? If you can just make this good faith effort and tell me honestly that you will come unless there are obstacles. And I know both of you will have obstacles. So I have to report you. Uh, it's my obligation. And if you miss four weeks worth, that's it. But because you're adjusting for me, um, I am not going to be, you know, a butt kicker type, right? I also want you, when you think of this class, I don't want you to think of, oh, I got to get this, you know, I mean, I want you to think about having a free mind because in our society now, the one thing they want to take away from you is a free mind. Do you understand that? Yeah. Yeah, if you're constantly distracted, somebody's making money off of you, you know, ba, 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 or it's it takes away a free mind and you can't have a democracy if people don't aren't able to detach and freely rethink something. So it matters a lot to me that you're not, you don't think of it as me, I have these requirements, blah, blah. Nothing to be afraid of, right? The class is, is freeing you up to think for yourself. Um, the research paper is not very long um, because the posts are long and there's a lot of reading. And then the final paper is long because you don't have to hand it in till Thursday, a final week, um, because I don't have that many students. So I, you should have enough time to write it by then. Um, if possible, it'd be fun to meet during final week online and give your presentation. But well, actually, I'll be here then. I'll be back after Thanksgiving. And so we can meet in the Miller Room again at one o'clock. Portfolios, if you are taking a lot of RPH, you need to save some of your papers. Then there's the honor code, the harassment, disabilities, and deadline. Um, do any of you have a question on any of this? Nope, none for me. What about you, Ivy? Yeah, okay, because... It, it was probably a little off-putting at first when you took your first Dr. Beck class, but the reason I have them all like this is it's a standardized thing. You know what to expect. Um, and here's to show you that I've got it all uh, posted and I've got the due date and the due time and all that stuff. So, okay. Now we go to the reading. Um, all right, let's do your reactions to the reading. And if Ivy didn't read it, we'll just listen to Leon. And I do have, oh gosh, I usually have my favorite quotes, but it's okay. I'll scroll through and pick a few things and Ivy can react to them. But what did, or actually Ivy, you can react to Liam, what he says too. Okay, Liam, what did you get? Um. Honestly, I think I read just as much from Rollo. Rollo, is that how you pronounce his name? Rollo, Rollo. Rollo, um, I learned that he was an existentialist, and it kind of made sense after reading about how, um, okay, what was it? How his art or his view of art is abstract, and that it's kind of, I think, from what I remember, it's a re it's a reflection of the mind. Um, Jeez, I wrote in some things. I didn't, I missed quite a bit of it because I did read it really late at night. So I don't remember much. Yeah, I got it and it was online. Um, so let's see, I don't think I got past page 24. All right, how many there's, pages are there? <laughs> so there's 14 in total. So 20, let's see, it starts on like 14. Oh, that's, that's confusing. It is two different formats, but 24 is the page number. So I got through two, three, four, five, 
I know some of those are her notes. So, like yeah, the some are pages. The last couple pages are notes, yeah. Um, but yeah, his, his questioning of beauty, beauty, I think it was a very, I want to say humanistic. Like it's, it's very focused on the self and the mind, which is, it, it's fairly individualized, which makes sense. I think that is kind of a modern interpretation, which makes sense because he is, I mean, it was published in 1985. That's, that's the gist of what I understood. All right. Well, let me tell you something. <clears throat> um, Liam, if you're in philosophy, this is a good issue because um, it really, to me, the philosophers come up with these theories and they don't even know what they're saying. And existentialism is one of them. Uh, so, yeah. I, I have to, you, okay, go ahead. I, I don't I, even think they know what they're saying or what it means, but what do you think? The people that I know that would call themselves existentialists are the same type of people that would call themselves nihilists and then worry about every little thing that's ever been said to or about them. It, <laughs> it's like the existential kind of like anxiety that they give themselves over not really knowing or caring about what's out there is kind of just them trying to lessen any of like their discomfort with life, at least my understanding. I'm definitely generalizing and sort of like stereotyping, um, but well, everybody call themselves a, a nihilist, existentialist, or an existential nihilist are usually just people that do concern themselves with others, but only when it can directly affect them. And it's, it's kind of an unhealthy way to think, in my opinion. Yeah, that's, that's how I'd sum it up, I think. Okay, I think one of the people in the world philosophies self-identified that way, but I don't remember who it was, so it doesn't matter. I, again, I think it might have been Thomas. Okay, well, here's the issue, you guys. It's a good example of uh, really what the confusion that goes on. All right, in the Enlightenment, we decided to make nature into silly putty that we would use and to make the human psyche into silly putty, okay? Now, there were, this is where you have this huge division between the, the British empiricism, where then you start social science and you start all these techniques, positive and reinforced and negative reinforcement, you're gonna mold people to be good. You're gonna set condition people so you have this wonderful middle class. And we're not gonna have any more of those horrible emotions from the past because they were based on all this, these, you know, religion, made up religion, the opiate of the people, you make up these ideas just to control people. And this huge gap between the rich and the poor created all this fear. And if we just get rid of it, it won't exist, right? That's the blank slate. But the other side was the continentalist and Sartre, Sartre was a continentalist, okay? And Kant said that we superimpose our concept of reason onto the natural world in order to understand it and then control it. So the source of our understanding is in our head. And then he says, there's uh, the things, the phenomenon that we see are, is one type of thing. And then there's the thing for itself, the noumena. And that's a complete black hole. Like that's um, nothingness. And so Sartre took that being as nothing. And so freedom means that every one of us is a freedom. And we literally create humanity every day in every way by what we do. Okay. And so I remember reading this. Uh, I don't know if you had the book Nausea, if you know about that book. But if you really think about it, 
It should make you sick to your stomach because it should give you this huge sense of responsibility. You're not just acting for yourself, you're acting for all of humanity. Does that, does that make sense, Liam? Yeah. Ivy, okay. Well, I remember reading that and going, oh my God, this is perfect for capitalism. Why do you guys wanna, this is a perfect capitalist point of view. Why would you say that? Why would I say that? Um, well, I don't think it's the capitalism itself you agree with, but I think if anything, going off of what you said, you said it was the perfect view of, of capitalism? Well, it would fit in. It would make a whole bunch of people completely compliant with it. Okay, I, so in that case, I'd assume that it was likely arguing that the social social responsibility that we should or do or at least should feel for each other can outweigh any negative impact because anything that happens will be outweighed by these social responsibility and actions of let's say the richer classes and that's what people thought was going to happen with trickle down economics thanks to reagan and I mean, now we have evidence that doesn't comply with that. A 50 year study saying the trickle down economics is minuscule, if even statistically significant. And if that isn't the case for that book, I'd probably assume that it just takes in and says that, or says something not about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, but probably about being able to participate in a system where no matter how little of a vote you have, you still have a vote because you have even a minor amount of capital, which is a common argument that I hear. Okay. Well, are the people who call themselves existentialists? Well, anyway, I don't want to go there. What I was thinking was, if you just wake up every morning saying, I am a freedom and I am creating humanity, um, then capitalism is always trying to distract you. You will never prioritize, right? You will just say, I am free and I make my choices. Well, capitalism is, <laughs> it's designed to like, hey, you know, what about this? What about this? There was an ad for Merrill Lynch stocks and it said, you know, to, to let yourself run free. It's about freedom. It means if you have money, you're free, right? And so my claim is that if you really want to have a decent life, you have to prioritize and you have to prioritize based on what's actually out there. So what's actually true is that other people depend upon you being mature and choosing one thing over another. Other people depend upon you to use the authority you have, you have for the well-being of them. Um, other people depend on you to leave behind a legacy of stories about how to live. Other people depend on you to integrate culture and nature, to respect the natural world. And even Rollo May, when he talks about that looking at the mountain and then abstracting it into these eternal forms, that's not existentialism, right? That's collective unconscious. That's evolutionary, right? That we we evolved appreciating these deeper forms. And when we have those ecstatic experiences, it's when we, we resonate with this deeper part of our psyche that we all have in common. That's the opposite of existentialism, which is that you are just this nothingness that invents humanity. Does that make sense, Leon? Yeah, yeah, I think it does. It's um, just so ironic that you know, people, it doesn't fit the theory at all. And yet it's just totally dominates the conversation. Yeah. No, I, I definitely think that um, the, air, the problem with this perversion of existentialism that ends up being used is the same as like the perversion of stoicism that a lot of like 
men try to use to perpetuate um, the toxic masculinity that has upheld the patriarchy where like you can't be, you have to be strong, you can't be vulnerable, you can't be close to people. You have to be like a pillar. You have to take care of your women too. Yeah, and it, it's a perverse of stoicism where like they'll use Marcus Aurelius and be like, well, he was strong and he was independent and he didn't really like get close to others. He was just this incredible guy when in reality like his most of his philosophy is about being vulnerable at the right times and being open when it's necessary and like when it when it isn't going to be used against you and like the stuff that would just be thrown out by these really weird like it's the same kind of guys that would be like Elon Musk is an incredible guy and Jeff Bezos deserves everything he has yeah. and I think I think that these those philosophies are inherently susceptible to being perverted just because of the fact that they are one it can be comfortable to think that like oh well nothing really matters and really easy to project your own logic and ideas into it especially when you can point to like one key phrase and be like this is what this is it's not something else it really um, worries me because you do inherit a legacy i mean that's just reality and what your forefathers did that was good, you 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 know you benefit from, and what they did that was bad, you suffer from, and then your generation has to do this. It's so blind, it's so ignorant. It drives me nuts. You're just yeah. ignoring what's right in front of your face, but it's so Western enlightenment, arrogant exceptionalism bullshit. But anyway, it, Ivy, what I wanted to ask you as an artist, okay like the difference between therapy and art so with therapy you might have just be talking be expressing your anxieties but if you're an artist you can express them in a way that tells a story or sings a song or a painting that will really resonate deeply with other people not just other people that have the same problems you have but just with humanity. And so when people appreciate your art, they, they understand, oh, this is human. Like lots of people have this, or I might've had it, but it doesn't matter if I've had it or not because it influences the culture. Like it's part of us that we're vulnerable to this kind of, or this kind of, what you're expressing like it's not just about her and it's not just about a few other people who've had the same kinds of traumas it's about life and we all learn from that and that resonates again deeper into the collective unconscious does that make sense to you ivy yeah okay and that's when you create a work of art do you sort of evaluate it that way? Did I really tap into something that's deeper that people could say I learn more about humanity by looking or listening to your stuff? When I make art, I don't really think about how will this be interpreted, if that makes sense. I'm not really. Oh, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't part think part about it while you're creating it. Definitely. But like afterwards, when I come back, I notice symbolism and everything. And it. it's like a lot of it, I would know the real message for, but other people might guess at it. And even then, maybe not the message that I was intending. So I honestly think it's just like, if you make the piece with an idea in your head, it would be easier to get something that more people would understand rather than just expressing yourself, if that makes sense. Of course, right? Whereas if you're an existentialist, there's no such distinction, right, Leon? Yeah. Um, this, all this, you're doing is expressing yourself. That's all, yeah. and all that somebody else can ever say is, well, that's him. <laughs> it's like you can't learn anything if you really take it for what it's saying and not keep imposing your own interpretations. But go ahead, Leon. 
I was going to say that I think art that is one of the inherent, uh, I guess, abilities of art is to convey message and emotion. And it, I specifically think of music because when I was a violinist, I frequently did improv. Like me and my friend Carlos, he played cello, I was violin, and we just start playing chords and then we just kind of riff off each other. And it would, like, we could feel two different things and we'd be conveying that to each other. And like, that is just, and eventually when we had started like writing stuff down, we would pick the meter and we'd pick the key and we'd pick all of these things. And even when we were doing that on our own, just conveying what we had inside, once we put it down, it could be sent to somebody else. And yes, they could interpret it differently, but there are these inherent, um, not inherent, but there are these practiced and understood ideas behind the certain aspects of the music that would usually be interpreted in one way. Or let's say if you swap from a major to a minor, it would become a different way. Or even if you sped it up a little, it could become even, or it could become happier. See, I feel like music is more, what's the word, straight to the point rather than images. Yeah. Like music is an art and there's, lots of genres and everything people go to they have their happy playlists sad playlists you know we use music to feel connected i guess in a way so like i get that then it's like how do you do that with an image you know like as you said you speed up the beat and you can feel when the music is like we did a study um I don't even know, I think it was like 2D or something, but Dustin put on a, a song and we basically closed our eyes and just let our hand depict the emotion from the song. But like, and you can kind of see the happiness in the strokes of the lines and everything, but it kind of looked the same as anger. Yeah, and like, it's like, how do you- it's, It can be speed that makes the pin a little more shaky or even press because you're going fast it's a thinner line which makes it look like you might have been pressing down more or if it's metal and everybody gets tense it can be like pressing harder and gripping the pin and it, it, it's it can be evident. yeah it can be evident and then once you add in color it can be totally different interpretations like the sky versus the ocean or a dark blue in the night sky trying to be serene or the dark blue in, like in the ocean where it's supposed to be scary so basically more details than that more details, it can be easier to convey, but then even with all of the detail of like starry night, there's so many different ways to look at it. Or with the self-portraits of Van Gogh and Picasso, you can look at it from so many different ways. Or even an MC Escher painting, I bet if you showed somebody to one, if you showed somebody one upside down, they have a little trouble telling it was upside down. They and, wouldn't really question it. Yeah, they wouldn't question it. So there, there can still be a lot conveyed and even with only a little detail, like in, um, what are they called, color planes? Mm -hmm. um, there, is, there is an inherent message that you're sending, but also you are, the entire point of what, for some artists, the entire point of what you're doing is to give them the opportunity to convey what they want in their interpretation. I, it, I still think it's an important um, aspect of art. To, of, for, to interpret and convey. So Ivy, have you ever created something with another person the way that Liam talks about music? Or is it really, you know, it's really you expressing yourself? I mean, I can't imagine trying to do a painting or anything. I mean, yeah, uh, we do the labs, but it's like, what you might think is sad the other person doesn't so it's kind of like a battle of this is what this means to me and this is what it means to me but like if like there's different people in the world so if both of you have some element of sadness that you agree surely someone else or multiple people will say hey there's sadness in this if that makes sense like your interpretation might be the same as the other person's and someone else might understand my point of view. And together we've captured both audiences. I'll tell you what's... Yeah, I think I get it. <laughs> I'll tell you, I don't know if you've had this, but in your deepest, darkest moments or your highest moments of ecstasy, right? Is, 
oftentimes that's when people feel the most isolated like nobody's ever fallen in love before right it's never been nobody's ever had it like this right or or suffering right nobody's ever been cheated on this badly or nobody's ever been so those moments those really deep moments when you feel totally alone that's, that's what the wisdom literature is trying to express so that you realize i'm not alone like this is humanity does that make sense to you yes yeah i um that i think that that's when people listen to music yeah that's when people listen. Art. <laughs> that's why 21 pilots is actually popular um the, i think that point is it ha was conveyed by my grandmother by marriage. Her name is Jane Conda. She is really big in the arts in Florida. And she's been a curator of a few art museums and she commissioned stuff. And like, I've been seeing her since I, since I was very young. And she would always tell like me and my twin sister about art and like the points of it and different things that you could interpret. And she did always let us know like how important it and any interpretation that you can get from it is, and you don't know my twin because she doesn't go here, but we are not very similar people. And no matter what we would do, we would always be encouraged to like discuss it between each other so that we can understand everything someone else can bring to or take from it. Okay. Um, yeah, well, that's, but you see, if given that you have to have this view of the collective unconscious, right? And it's not existentialism truly. What it did was cut you off from that. You can't refer to that because that's an excuse, right? You're totally free. And that just drives me nuts the way that people don't know what they're saying. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do is um, I'll start looking at some of what he says. But I think next time. We'll just spend part of the time looking at this um, because it is, I think it fits with a lot of what you said. Um, and we still have what? We have 10 minutes, 12 minutes. So I'll scroll down. I have, you know, it's kind of a weird reading because I have obviously marked it up. But what is right? What is beauty? He says it gives you joy and peace simultaneously. It's, um, it's creative, it reveals form in the universe, and, um, but it, your imagination, right, is involved in trying to find this form. Um, it's an effort to integrate yourself, integrate emotions and consciousness. You're trying to actually, you know, have integrity in your life to get away from being split. Um, it's a kind of revelation. Um, in a, it's beauty is some kind of truth, in a sense, parallel to science. But in what way is it? In what way isn't it, right? Um, it produces new knowledge, but not in the way that science does, right? For science, everything has to be verifiable, right, and objective. The detached observers have to be able to check your data. Uh, for art, that's not true. There's a new depth of experience. It comes as a gift. Then he tells a story about Mont Blanc, and he stared at it for a long time. And all of a sudden, it started to look different. Um, it became abstract, and there's this ultimate form. Um, it's a kind of, let's see, ecstasy. It's uh, ecstatic, right, outside of yourself you get absorbed in something other than yourself, something outside of yourself, um, as opposed to banal consciousness, which, you know, most of us have to live in that, but that's what so annoys me about this damn phone, is it's always trying to bring you back to banal consciousness. The thing it doesn't want is for you to have ecstatic, transcendent experiences, because then you won't buy stuff. You won't be a good consumer. And you, won't, and you won't vote according to what somebody's manipulated you into trying to vote, right? 
the way to get money and power is to take away that, that desire, even the desire for some kind of uh, self-transcendence. Um, I think it's really a problem. <laughs> but, you know, I'm a philosopher, so. Um, artists are the ones who are able to figure this out. Um, they can somehow expand their consciousness and get to the essence and express it in a particular way. So they live at this point where essence and existence come together. And then Cezanne's trees. Um, I have a slideshow and I'm gonna show that the last few minutes. Um, a sense of meaning and purpose. You would never question whether life is meaningful. And that's where Sartre says, I know that it's meaningless, it's nothingness. That's so arrogant, it just drives me nuts. Um, what's the function of beauty? Then Guernica about grief. And again, we can go through the slides again next time if you want to have your reactions after you've read this. But that he, you know, he presents this really brutality, not to glorify it, but to get people to say never, never again. Like this is so wrong. Um, Let's see, modern art and uh, is exposing violence to expose the fact that science, all this enlightenment stuff hasn't worked. The earth are saying, no, you know, you have to, this is, there's something wrong with this. Um, he was on a ship with a Turk and a, a German and they saw a sunset and they all agreed it was beautiful even though he had all these stereotypes about the Turks and the Germans. Um, and then the stuff about folk art, where people just it, spontaneously, they cannot live with bare bones. They have to decorate their clothing. They have to have flowers outside their house. Um, they just can't. People have to have sensuality, beauty, beauty design. Um, they have this deep, deep need for it, organic need for it. Um, let's see. Um, fundamental form, our common human language is our sense of proportion and balance and harmony. Um, let's see, beauty and literature um, in, interprets our deepest symbols and myths. And then I have some excerpts from another book about um, uh, our culture worships change. And um, let's see, and then he talks about um, ontological beauty and beauty as harmony and the Greeks, sorry about this. Um, but yeah, he talks about his statue, right? He has this picture and this, you can't really tell if it's male or female. It's just um, a microcosm in the macrocosm, like her, her, her mind is a reflection of the universe and she has everything in proportion and harmony. And um, I'll tell you, this is one of the things I have on my desk <laughs> that I got in Greece, right? It was kind of heavy to carry it on the backpack, but hey, it's worth it. So <laughs> um, I, again, I would never say the Greeks are the only ones ever. It's just that this is what I studied. That's all I can say. Um, this is Mount Blanc actually. And there it is again, and there's a painting of it, right, where they've abstracted it. And there's a city where it's a similar kind of abstraction. And there's another city, right, an abstraction of it. Here's the lilies, and the article talks about Monet's lilies. And then it talks about Cezanne's trees. So here's a picture of the trees. There's a painting of the trees. There's another one. And this is a Cezanne, this one. Um, oh, and this is the Cezanne that, that, you know, so you just think about that and there's another Asian version. Um, and then look at that, you know, the way they, that artist paints trees. Then there's Guernica. I, I assume you know that painting and there's another one similar that conveys brutality, not to, to justify it or glorify it or make people immune to it. It's to try and get people to, to you know, say no. Um, there's colonialism. Um, there's 
a sunset in Greece uh, because he was in Greece. Here's the Turkish rugs he talks about. Here's the folk culture. And this one is, you know, the famous painting. And um, Collingwood says, you know, if the only purpose of it was to go hunt the, the deer, the buffalo, you could have just, you know, done four legs and, you know, go get it, you know. But obviously, this painter, this person had an incredible sense of design and beauty, which is so amazing, right? It's this huge, very old, and yet there it is. The love of beauty just shines like crazy. Um, okay, so is there anything I said that um, that you might want to react to? Um, I don't think I have any full reactions, but I do have a bunch of small bits that I now want to go look for and at. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Um, on ontological perspectives specifically, because I know I've learned about ontology, but every time I hear it, I immediately think, oh, it's deontology, and I just immediately have a negative reaction. Oh, that's Kant. No, that's not yeah. But here, here's the chart where basically we, we, this is where we have a similar view every time. So he says we have an innate sense of beauty and that's what makes art possible. And then at proportion, balance, harmony, fundamental form, it's a universal language. We, we use our imagination to try and express it and we create these forms. Um, art is the instrument by which beauty is actualized. Art is our endeavor to realize beauty. Art is an inner eye to express how we see the world. And it includes the integration of primary and secondary processes. It's these ecstatic experiences. It takes us outside of ourselves. And then there's a lot of different examples, right? Um, the, the physicists, Einstein, scientists, physicists, Cezanne, Mont Blanc, tragedy, um, the sunset, Aristotle, Plato. So, and then the categories in this class, we have this set of categories. And then, so here's the, you know, it's the priorities, um, the nature of reality. And then you go, there's all these different layers. And then I put the name of the author who really emphasizes that particular place on the ladder which I think is really interesting. Um, so anyway, um, uh, Rollo May it starts with, we have this innate sense and it's related to our biological nature and our evolution. Um, but then for next time also calling it, and I have the page numbers and examples and the reading is way, way longer than the page numbers, um, but Anyway, I got to make sure also, I have a Collingwood number one. I have to make sure that um, this starts on page 98 and this one starts on page what? 79, so what did I have here? Yeah, 78 and 79. So you can definitely read more of it if you want to. It's just that there's not very much reading, but there's a lot of you reacting to it. And um, and then also the Rollo May. So that would be for next Tuesday in person. Um, any questions about that? Nothing for me. Okay. I do think it's going to be nice. And it's going to be nice if you guys come together um, and, you know, do it like we're doing today even though that'll be at what time? Eight at night, but the Miller room will be open. Um, I think that makes it easier. Does that make sense to you? Wait, um, just to re- It's in the morning, right? Not at night. Is it the morning for us or the morning for you? Oh, it's 8 oh, a.m. Yeah. Oh, that's right, it's 8 a.m. for you, sorry. I keep getting that, yeah. So. So the Miller room is open by eight o'clock. I know that. Um, I guess you could find out if there's actually a class going on there, but but you can find any room and just 
if if that is that make sense that I would really prefer that because I think the dynamic of the class is a lot better. <laughs> Talk yeah. about dynamic. Gotcha. Yes, I, um, I, I think the dynamic would be good. An artist and a person that questions everything. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. All right. And then Ivy is going to stay for my legacy of ancient Greek civilization. You want to take it, uh, Liam? I uh, currently am petitioning for 18 hours. I almost did 21, but then I was like, I'm going to drop a county. So thanks. Uh, anyway, if you want to sit in, Ivy and I are going to be talking about it right after you leave. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's a bad meeting, but I may at some point. Thank you. Well, good class. I will see you guys later. See you. Okay. Good to see you. All right, Ivy. So, okay. Let's see. Now you have accepted the invitation in this class. Yep. All right. And now we'll go to the legacy one. Um, here it is. And have you you've accepted? Oh, you haven't accepted the invitation to this one yet. Can you? Have you gotten it? No, I don't remember seeing. That. It's odd because it's there, right? Here it is, your name, invited. Uh, do I, should I, tr I don't know how to do it over again either. The legacies? Yeah. Of ancient civilization. What? The legacies of ancient civilization. I thought I was in uh, the Greek legends. Well, actually, it's the legacy of ancient Greek civilization in the era of globalization. That was the name of the name. So you don't see the invitation? I, did it work? I, yeah, I just accepted it. Okay, well, okay, good. That should come through then. Um, I'll check it in a minute. We can go back to the stream, but let's see. There we go. There you go, you're in. Okay, ah. So this class doesn't have to last a whole hour and 15 minutes. It can just be an hour or whatever, because you're on the spot, right? <laughs> and, you know, whatever you want. But um, so now we scroll down. OK, I cannot figure out how to, you know, put a post in the middle of the whole stream. Um, so there's a lot of the posts are listed up here. But they're listed in the class in the classwork. So uh, can you go to where those three dots are? Maybe you can change the order. I can't. All it says is move to the top. But but I think you can post it over here under classwork. And that's totally in the right order. Does that make sense? So August 19th, August 26th, September 2nd, September 9th. It's all, that's all in a perfect order. Okay, and those are the correct dates? Yep, and it's 7 p.m. Because that'll be 7 a.m. my time. Of course, daylight savings time will end. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. It actually ends isn't it, toward the end of October. And I, I fly back October 30th, so there might be just a week or two there that's kind of messed up um all right all right so we got that so now the stream we're going to um the legacy class and the syllabus is going to be let's see so this have i got no no it's supposed to be monday wednesday i've got the wrong time but um well, let's work that all out next week <laughs> when I'm here. But it's going to be nine, nine, 
15 on Monday, Wednesday, instead of Tuesday, Thursday, unless you would rather have it staggered. If you, if you want both classes right in a row, or if you would like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, do you have a preference? What do you mean? Aren't both classes going to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Well, they can just be twice a week for oh, well, Monday, Friday or Monday, Wednesday, Monday, week. Wednesday. Um, so, OK, so I have one other class Tuesday, Thursday at eight o'clock. And so you could take the 930. You can take this one at 930 either. Monday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Thursday. Monday, Wednesday. You want them right back to back? Yeah, that okay. way I have all my classes on Monday, Wednesday. Right, and you'll be done by 9.30. Okay. So, uh, so we'll do eight to 9.15, well, wait, 9.15 to 10.15, okay. I have a class at 10. You have a class at 10, okay. Um, on which days? Every day? Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay, so let's do this one Tuesday, Thursday. Is that okay? Yeah. Tuesday, Thursday, 9.30, just to 10.30. Is it in person or? Oh, it'll be in person next week, but no, no, I'm going to be in Indonesia, so. Um, so... Can we do this one online next week? I might not wake up early enough to walk to the school for this class. How, how much of a walk is it? It's like a 30 minute walk. Okay, so, well, all right. The other class meets at eight, eight in the morning. On Monday, right? And Monday and Wednesday. And then this one would meet Tuesday, Thursday at 9.30. And you can see if you have classes. Okay, so. For the RPH 310, it's meeting Monday. Monday, Wednesday, 8 a.m. Do you have an 8 o'clock or a 9 o'clock on no. Monday and Wednesday? I don't have an 8 or 9 o'clock on Monday and okay, Wednesday. Okay, because we're meeting a little longer, right? Um, How long? It, it'll be 8 till when? 9.15, because if it meets twice a week, then, um, the same so, if, so if we do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, then no, we don't have to do Friday. I'm thinking we won't meet Friday. We'll just meet two days a week. I'm saying, but if we do, then it would end at nine. Oh, yeah. At the usual 8.50. Whoops. 